Hey, Graceway, my name is Pastor Andrew Dudu, and this is my wife, Tylina. Thank you so much for joining us for a brand new series called Relationship Goals. We are so excited to be back in the building every other week. Yeah. This week's service is happening both in person and online. We'd love to have you join us for our next in-person gathering on February 21st at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. And as always, we'll be live streaming all of our services if you cannot join us in person. If you're looking for a way to deepen your relationship with Jesus and discover how you can make a difference in your community, we want to invite you to Grow Track today at 10.30 a.m. and noon online. Grow Track is the simplest way to get connected with what God is doing at Graceway. Take out your phone and go to visitgraceway.org slash growtrack to get registered. And before we get started, take a moment and click the subscribe or follow button so you can keep up with what is happening at Graceway. Now let's get ready to hear from Pastor Tim. All right, all right, Graceway, how are you? Very, very good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. There's a lot of red in the house today. There's a game tonight. Yeah, y'all feeling good about it? Who, who you got? I said to the first service, we'll know that we have ultimately understood the gospel when a Buccaneers fan could walk in here and be welcome, right? Uh, we're not there yet, though. And so if you are watching online, we're uh, glad to have you join us. Thanks for being here. I'm calling 3524 Chiefs tonight. Yeah, that, that's my prediction. It's interesting. I mean, I, Pastor Ben and I were talking about this. You know, he's got one Chiefs shirt, right, that he pulls out once a year. And I said, man, you're going to be wearing that for a handful of years to come. The Chiefs are so good. Uh, that, that costs us $500 million in one position, but we'll take it. And I think we're going to be here uh, year after year. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to start a new series today, Relationship Goals. I'm excited about it as we head into the month of February. And this is a, this is a timely, I think, topic for us because our relationship norms have changed over the last 12 months or so, haven't they? I was watching a Chinese comedian who recently came to the United States, and it was fascinating to hear his routine talking about his observation of American culture, and he said his perspective is that every American uh, has a race that they run every single evening of their lives, and that is to see how many screens they can get between their face and the wall before the night ends. And that has definitely proven true in COVID, right? Uh, none of us were happy about COVID, but Zoom and Netflix have had pretty good years. And, and, and you know, I, I think about my own life. I got my iPhone, I got my iPad, I got my MacBook, I got Apple TV, and I got an Apple Watch, right? And all of these things, all of these ways to distract, all of these opportunities to kind of veg out or be entertained. But here's maybe what you don't know. The human eyes are created with two sets of vision. One is panoramic view, and it's what happens when you're out kind of taking a hike, right? When all of the the landscapes and the horizon is there for you. And when you're in that spot, you have less depth perception, but you also have less cortisol. In other words, the reason you feel good at the end of a hike is that you have less stress hormones going through your body. The opposite is true when you're doing this or this or this or this or this, right? Depth perception is higher, focus is higher, but cortisol goes up. You're more stressed at the end of watching the screen and the sense of claustrophobia kicks in. Some of you I just described, your entire global pandemic experience, right? That we keep going to the spots. We're looking at boxes for, for uh, the opportunity to be entertained or to veg out while we're spending more time in a box called our house or apartment than we have at any other point in our life. And that's before we add to it this reality that so many of us, when the pandemic hit, we thought to ourselves, you know, a slowdown wouldn't be bad, right? Like I work a little less, go a little few places, but that the American worker has had a work week increase of almost 40% during COVID. Especially if you work from home, the average work week was eight hours in America, which is already high uh, for the global workplace. In COVID, it's a little over 11 hours a day. And so I'm claustrophobic, my cortisol is high, I'm overworked, I'm feeling stressed out, and that's before I add to that equation another human being, right? And that human being, whether it be your roommate, your parent, or your spouse, is going through the same thing. They're 
pursuing the same entertainment, the same distraction, the same veg out. They're getting stressed out as they do it. They feel claustrophobic. They're working as hard as you do, and you love them, and they love you if they're your spouse, but you're seeing them just a little bit too much. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And right now, I'm not feeling much fonder. You know what I'm saying? Right? Uh, you're stressed, and, and I'm stressed, and we're seeing so much, and we're in this house that used to feel like a good amount of space and now it feels like it's way too small and that's before I add to that small human beings called kids. Bless your kid's heart, right? I mean, they're going to school with masks on and behind screens or worse yet, they're going to school looking at a computer screen. They are displaced from their friends. They're seeing a lot of their siblings and not a lot of their friends. They are spending the day looking at screens. They get done their stress is high, their claustrophobia is high, their annoyance is high. They don't want to be told what to do, especially if it involves cleaning their room. Can I get a good amen? Yeah? And so I'm stressed, you're stressed, they're stressed, we're stressed, and that's before I add to any of those things, things like isolation, right? The fact that I haven't been able to go to church on a regular basis for a year. For a year. Can you, are you kidding me? And that's before I add to that isolation, racial tension. That's before I add to Racial tension, economic downturn. That's before I had economic downturn. A presidential election with a 24-hour news cycle. Are you kidding me? And social media out the wazoo. And I do mean out the wazoo, right? Enough already with the social media. And that's before I add to it a pandemic that feels like it's never going to end. All of these things are happening to all of us, and in the intersection of our interaction with one another, we're stressed, we're claustrophobic, we're tired of one another, we just want to get out, but we can't. It's taken a long time. What more could go wrong? And that's before I head to that. I think the most powerful component, which is spiritual warfare. So many of you, uh, even if I didn't articulate your experience over the last 12 months, I have had everybody say to me, it just feels like something's wrong. It just feels like something's broken right now. We're so divided. Everybody's disagreeing. We feel more free in our poor treatment of one another. It just, it just feels like we're under attack from absolutely every side. And spiritual warfare almost always shows up in our relationships. And at the heart of spiritual warfare, at the heart of all spiritual warfare, is a lie. At the heart of all spiritual warfare is a lie, and the front for most spiritual warfare is our relationships. And over the last 12 months, you've been experiencing a handful of things that have tangible application, but I think have spiritual realities underlying them. And so I want to talk to you today about five relationship lies as we begin this series. I think that it's going to be helpful to you in the midst of COVID, but I think it would be helpful to you regardless because it's going to teach to you what the enemy tries to do and what he's trying to accomplish in the destruction of our relationships for deeper purposes. And so I want you to get to Genesis chapter 3 with me. If you have a Bible, if you, if you do have a Bible, please bring it. It's important for you to be able to see it with your own eyes. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. It'll be up on the screen otherwise. But here's the big idea. Relationships work best when we let the one who designed them define them. Relationships work best when we let the one who designed them define them. We believe that God is the designer of relationships, that he's a relational God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that he created us in his image, that you need relationships. That's why we do small groups. That's why we do congregational worship. It's this assumption that we are better together. God designed them, and so he should define them. But anytime God's at work designing and defining, the enemy's at work deceiving to destroy. Anytime God's at work, the enemy is at work. And we see this right off the bat in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Read along with me. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the free fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall we touch it, lest you die. Warning, Will Robinson, right? She added right away to what God had said. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desired to make one wise. And she took the fruit and ate and also gave it to her stupid, silent, no leading, submissive husband who didn't, wouldn't worth a doggone thing. 
That's my addition, right? Who was with her, and he obediently did what she said. We'll get to that later. Then the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. A couple weeks ago, uh, I led you to what I hope was a good understanding of the context of this scripture. We talked about spiritual warfare. I did, and then I thought Pastor Todd did a great pastoral job just kind of helping us know how to be victorious in spiritual warfare. But this, this text happens in a context of a, a war that has eternally been going on. And, and as I was meditating on that and on this series, I thought to myself that this temptation was intended to create rebellion from our first parents to God, our Heavenly Father, but that the medium that he utilized to accomplish his rebellion was relationships. You see, the garden was a triangulation of three relationships. It was God's relationship to Adam and Eve. It was Adam's relationship to Eve. And it was Adam and Eve's relationship to creation and their calling. And the enemy attacks all three of them in these seven verses. The enemy knows that if he can ruin relationships, he can create a destructive posture toward all elements of faith and life for you. The enemy knows, I'm going to say it to you again, that if he can ruin certain relationships, he can create destruction in the ripple effect of those relationships being ruined. Let me prove it to you. How many of you don't raise your hand, but you had a tough relationship with a parent, particularly a father? In that singular relationship, what was it, uh, its effect on other philosophies and concepts and relationships in your life? If you didn't have a good relationship with your dad, you probably struggled with a sense of well-being and safety and security, a sense that you are loved unconditionally. You probably had incorrect information regarding marriage, regarding parenting, and regarding God himself. One relationship. And your theology struggles, your marriage struggles, your parenting struggles, your sense of well-being and worth struggles. That's why the enemy attacks it. Can I give you another one? There's a pandemic of language that is, man, I just have a hard time with church, man. I got a hard time with church. Just, I got some church baggage. Can I tell you? You don't have church baggage. You don't have church baggage. What do you mean that I don't have church baggage? You have baggage from somebody that you went to church with. You don't have church baggage. Nobody has a disagreement with the idea of the church, a community formed by the blood of Jesus according to the will of the Father, accomplished by the Son of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, where God's mercy is extended to us through the relationships that are formed, that Jesus is the head of the church and that we are the hands and feet to bring love, justice, and mercy to the entire world. Nobody has an issue with that. You have an issue with somebody that you used to go to church with that harmed you, betrayed you, or that you don't like anymore. And so, because of that church member, you say things like, I have church baggage. The enemy knows that if you four churches ago got sideways, particularly with somebody in church leadership, that he can ruin your belief in the mechanism that God says he uses in the world today. One relationship ruins the church. One relationship changes your view on God, on marriage, on parenting. The enemy loves to get into relationships so that he can cause carnage in other places. Relationships are always the means that the enemy works in, in a multi-layered purpose. And how he attacks them, he did it then, and he does it now. And so I want to give you five lies. And I want to tell you just up front that some of these lies are going to feel corrective. And they're going to feel like warnings because sometimes when there's a lie, the only thing you can say is that's not true. And so there's going to be some things today that I'm going to say that's not true. It's not true. And your belief in it is creating damage in you, whether you know it or not. And there are going to be some other lies that when we pull the covers back, you're going to see hope and encouragement. And I'm excited to show those to you. So five lies, take good notes, and let's get into it together. The first lie that we see around relationships is this phrase, did God actually say? Did God actually say the first words that we see from God's eternal enemy, Satan, who represents himself as a serpent, he asks, he questions the word of God. Now you say, that doesn't sound like a lie. It sounds like a question. But questions are incredibly powerful things, aren't they? A question can lead us to learn and discover. But a question that's well-worded and wrongly motivated can confuse and deceive us. And one of the main ploys of the enemy, one of the main tools that he loves to use is questions that feel harmless 
but their intent is to get you to question things that provide stables or pillars of your faith. That if you question this, multiple things will topple from it. And so let me clarify some things. And I want to clarify something that you're not going to like. Some of you are going to get frustrated that I'm even saying this, but I want to be a good pastor to you. And it's so incredibly important for you to hear everything that I'm about to say so that you can hear the things that are going to come next. Will you let me say it to you? Okay, you said that I could. Here we go. We have the incredible privilege of having the completed Word of God accessible to us in our language, don't we? We have the incredible privilege of having all 66 books of the canon of Scripture in our language. If you go to my office, I literally have stacks of Bibles, and I read some of them. I preach from others, and I have another probably 150 Bibles on all of my devices. It's so accessible that sometimes I get afraid that in the American church we feel a little bit entitled. We feel a little bit entitled when it comes to the Word of God. Do you know how I know? Because sometimes we argue about which version you're reading or why it means that if I read this, I love Jesus more than you. We're willing to divide over the accessibility of God's Word to us. It just doesn't seem right to me that we have so much that there's enough for us to argue about, that we have so much that rather than feeling grateful, we feel entitled and so entitled that there's a hierarchy that is, if I read this one and you read that one, it's because I love Jesus a little bit more than you. It's a problem. The other concern that I have is that sometimes because there's all this argument and all this entitlement about accessibility to the Word of God, sometimes I think that some of us end up being more passionate about the Bible than we are about God. Some of us are more concerned about which version gets read and who's reading and how much they're reading than do they actually have a loving relationship with God that redeems and renews, forgives and sets them free. But for the vast majority of Christians throughout history, I need you to understand, this was not the medium that they used to have a relationship with God. King David didn't have this. Abraham didn't have this. Noah didn't have this. Moses didn't have this. Paul didn't have this. We're incredibly blessed and we're incredibly um, privileged to be able to have this. But for a good part of history and for a good part of the world, they don't, they don't have This is the reason that, that we spend tens of thousands of dollars a year translating the Bible for people who don't have it. We're actually getting ready to complete a project that we've been working on for a handful of years for a, a, a group of people, the Nam Kelly people in West Africa. They will have a Bible in their hands because of your generosity. It's an incredible thing. It's an absolutely incredible thing, and I love being a part of a church like that, and we got another project coming up that I'm so excited about. I just can't tell you about it quite yet. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible, and we're going to, as long as I'm pastor here, invest thousands and thousands of dollars in this because... For those who have received much, there's much for us to steward. Amen? So let me say it to you this way, and this is what you're not going to like. The bullseye of my faith is not the Bible. The bullseye of my faith is God himself. Now that sounds like semantics, but it's incredibly important for you. And if you transplant the bullseye of your faith with anything but God, things break down the line. God is the center of our faith. And the Bible is the book that he gave to us and privileged us to have accessible to us in his language. And he says that it is true. And because I trust him, I trust it. It's very important. Because I trust him, I trust it. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. We serve a God who speaks. We serve a God who is accessible to us through his very words. The Bible is God's very words. It will not contradict him. Amen. And when I contradict it, I am contradicting him. And so I want you to have a relationship to the Bible so that you can get to know your God. 
I want you to love it. I want you to cling to it. I want you to be grateful for it. I want you to acknowledge the abundance and privilege that it is that you have a stack of them on your shelf. I want you to be amazed by it. I want you to fall more deeply in love with God and more deeply in trust of God because of your relationship to the Bible. I am not saying that the Bible is not fundamentally important for a person of faith. I will put my theology on the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible against anybody in this room or watching online. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying be careful if God is not at the bullseye of your faith. Be careful. And I'm saying that when I have a relationship to it, I can hear from him. And I'm also saying that what he has to say isn't always easy. I'm not saying it's not trustworthy. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's not always easy, especially in something as intimate and personal as our most important relationships. And so the enemy comes along, especially when we're struggling in them and we're stressed with them and I'm claustrophobic and you're, I love you, but you're getting on my nerves and I love you, but if you ask me to play video games one more time, I might just throw you out of a window. In those times, the enemy comes along and he says, did God really say to you? Did God really say that you're to mutually submit to one another? Did he really say... Did he really say that you're supposed to love your wife as Jesus loved the church? No pressure. Did he really say that? Did he really mean that during, during COVID? Did he really say that you're supposed to submit to your husband? Submit, submit, Jesus. You know, we don't do that in 2021. We're way too progressive to do that. Did he really, really say that? Does he really talk about forgiveness and long-suffering and being filled with the Spirit and being patient? Does he really say, love your enemies and pray for those who, dis who spitefully use you? It's not that you don't understand what it says. The question is whether or not you trust what he says. And here's what I want you to understand. If you start to question the veracity of the Word of God, you have already lost. Your relationships will already be fundamentally ruined because they cannot be founded upon the trustworthy Word of God, which represents the person of God. The enemy will always attack, did God really say, especially when you, he knows you're vulnerable to another perspective because you're struggling in your current circumstance. Relationships are difficult, but Tim Keller says, if your God never disagrees with you, it might be that you're worshiping an idealized version of yourself. If God always agrees with you and not your spouse, if God always hates who you hate and likes who you like, if God always votes for who you voted for, it might be that you're asking God to listen to you and not the other way around. God did say, God speaks, God is trustworthy. And we base our relationships on what he says is so because he is the designer and the definer of all of our relationships. Can I get a good amen on that? Ooh, I said a good amen. Come on, somebody. I know you got the mask on. And you're like, he can't hear me. I can hear you, all right? Can I get a good amen on that? Yeah. Lie number two, choices don't have consequences. Choices don't have consequences. Here's how it sounds. You've been having a rough year. A lot of stress. If you do this thing, it's not going to hurt anyone. It's not really going to do anything. Satan loves to promote the idea of victimless sin. Satan loves to promote the idea of victimless sin. But God says in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. That there are desires that I have that are terminal for myself and for those around me. The enemy says, consequences and choices are not connected, but here's what the Bible says, that sin will take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. There are decisions, and I wanna to talk to you if you're single, there are decisions that you're making right now, decisions about what you think is true, about your integrity, around your purity, around your pursuit of holiness and your relationship to God, decisions that some people know about and other decisions that nobody knows about. 
that are either going to complicate or simplify your marriage and your relationship to your kids. Decisions that you're making right now. You see, the way that it works is that you have the ability to choose. You have responsibility and stewardship and choice. But can I tell you what you don't get to choose is the consequences of your choices. The enemy says there are no consequences, but I can promise you from my own life, and I can promise you from hours and hours of counseling, and I can promise you from lots of time reading God's Word that God says the exact opposite. Let me prove it to you. You've received things from your parents that you didn't get to pick. That red hair, that's from your dad. That impatience, that's from your mom. That short-tempered, that's from your granddaddy. That thing that you like to do that you don't really know why you like to do it, it's because it was given to you, because they made a choice, and because consequences come down to us. And here's what's going to happen. You receive consequences from your parents, and if you don't deal with those consequences and make different choices, you'll take their consequences, add your consequences to them, and share them to your kids. You say, that's not very positive. I'm positive that you receive consequences. And that when we don't bring those consequences under the blood of Jesus and break the spiritual and generational authority that has been shared with us, we receive it, add to it, and pass it down, listen, three to four generations. You're going to tell me that consequences and choices aren't connected? The Bible says, my family normally sits on the front row, they were there in the first service, that the decisions that I make, some that are known and some that are unknown, I not only hand to my kids but their kids and their kids' kids. I'm gonna be dead before those kids show up, but they are going to be experiencing my decisions if I don't bring them under the authority of God and His Word. Your passions need parameters. Your passions need parameters because some desires are destructive. And this is the lie, especially in America. If you want it, you should have it. If you want it, you should have it. And the the more passionate, the more desire you have, the more in love you are with the idea or the person. Who's to say that you shouldn't be able to have that? The only question is that some things that I love create loss in my life. Some things that I love are actually destructive. Some things that I want I'm passing down to my kids some passions that have no parameters are creating carnage in the people around me. And I have all of the emotions and all of the desires and all of the passions and all the love to explain it, but ultimately, choices have consequences. And so as Christians, we obey God from love. You're not obeying God for love. You obey God from love. You already have it. And we say, God, I trust your word and I know that you love me. And so I'll take your word and place trust in it that you're trying to protect me from certain damages, even though I desperately want it. And we obey for love, meaning for the love of those we share life with. Can I tell you, there are certain things that I do only because I love God. And there are certain things that I don't do only because I love my wife and kids. And the love that I have for them supersedes the desire I have for it. Can I get an amen on that? And both are holy pursuits. And so a Christian is somebody who says, I receive love and so I obey you gladly. And I love them, so there are certain passions that I have that I curb and put parameters on. There are certain desires that I have that if I did them, it would be destructive to them. And so I say no to them and yes to you and I cling to grace in the meantime. Because the reality of it is, my strength to forego certain passions and desires is much too adequate, and I need the gospel to be real. With all my desire to hand a, a good experience growing up in my and my wife's house down to my kids, can I tell you, I want that desperately, but I'm far too broken to do it every single day. And so I have to pray hard and rely on grace. Are you with me? Because choices matter. And because I'm broken, because if the gospel is not a real thing, no matter what I want, I'm going to hand a brokenness down to my boys and my little girl. And so, God, I want to obey you, and I do love you, and there are certain things that I'm going to forgo. But in the meantime, God, would you be bigger than my failings? 
because I acknowledge that choices have consequences. Amen? Amen. Line number three, God is keeping things from you. Choices don't have consequences. Did God really say? And God's keeping things from you. The theology of our day is called individualism. It's the elevation of the individual above everything else. We place enormous stock in what seems right to us. And in that framework, experiences, opportunities, and information, we assume that the more we get, the better. Because I want to experience, because I want to know, because I want to take advantage of this opportunity, who are you to tell me that I shouldn't be able to? We assume that more is better, but in Genesis chapter 3, God is protecting Adam and Eve from something. You see, the, the, the most diabolical thing about this lie is that it's true. There are things that God is trying to keep from you. In Genesis chapter 3, the enemy comes and he, he infers God's trying to keep some things from you. And God was trying to retain something in Adam and Eve that our culture scoffs at. God was trying to keep something in place that our culture, that's so stupid. You know what it was? Their innocence. I don't, I don't know why it is that our culture thinks that, that innocence is something uh, so naive. You want to be cultured and experienced and have every opportunity you can and know everything that you can know so you can have the widest perspective. Can I tell you there are certain things you don't want to know? You don't want to know. You don't want to feel that. You don't want to know that. You don't want to go through that. There are some things that God is trying to keep from you. And the enemy twisted that good father perspective and said he's trying to keep good things from you. And he still does that. There are some things that God wants you to be naive about. One of the simplest ways that you can know you're experiencing spiritual warfare. Listen, I'm going to make this as practical as I can is when there is something that you want to do that sounds fun and that you resent that God says no. One of the simplest ways for you to know, I'm experiencing spiritual warfare right now, is for you to think to yourself, it would be awesome if I could do that, but doggone it, God is a killjoy. And God says no. Because the enemy comes along and says, why doesn't God want you to have that? Why doesn't God you know, want you to have that experience or want you to have that information or want you to have, but, but listen to what Psalm 16 verse 11 says. You make known to me the path of life and in your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God says if you want full joy, it's in his presence. God says if you want pleasure, it's with him. It frustrates me. It frustrates me how little enjoyment and how little, how, how not enjoyable so many Christians are. It frustrates me that so many of us think if I'm really having a good time, God probably is frustrated. So many of us, you're far less enjoyable than you should be if you actually believe what God said was true about you and him. Christians are viewed as the most boring, the most bland, the most critical, the most condescending, the most And it's antithetical to God. Because somewhere along the way, we have fallen under the marketing plan of the enemy who says, when you're having fun, it's because you're doing something that God wouldn't approve of. And because we buy into that lie, we're prone to misunderstand that one of the most loving things that God does is to call us out of sin. God's not calling you out of sin to keep you from experiencing joy. He's calling you out of sin to preserve your innocence. Why? Because innocence gives way to wonder. Wonder is curiosity and optimism that gives way to joy. Listen to me very carefully. I can steal your joy if I take your innocence. The enemy says the opposite. If you just knew, you would have more joy. God says, you not knowing is what sets you up to enjoy. The enemy twists it. If you knew about this, you'd be having so much fun. And God says, I'm keeping it from you because innocence gives way to joy. 
They're connected in the Bible. And so on the cross, God replaces and retains our innocence in Jesus. And through our innocence comes wonder, and through our wonder comes joy. They are related to one another. You knowing things produces hurt and betrayal and cynicism and bitterness and boredom. And so God says, there's certain things that I want you to know on my time, and there's other things that I don't want you to ever know. I don't want you to ever know. Lie number four. Are you still with me? Your life is better when you're leading it. Your life is better when you're leading it. Now, this is an important lie because it's a lie that you can only believe if you've believed one of the first three. And this is how the enemy works. I'm going to give you a small lie here because the one that I really want you to believe is the big one over here. And the enemy knows that if he starts over here, your theology is far too good. You come to a church that tries to teach you the Bible, and so if he starts at the big lie, it's not going to work. But if he can get you off kilter around the possibility that God is saying the truth has good things for you and that choices have consequence, you'll be up for this next lie. That your life is better when you're leading it. Your life is better when you're leading it. Let me give you two times that you're going to be most prone to believe this lie. The first is when you're struggling. Like having gone through a global pandemic. Like being stressed out, claustrophobic, stress hormone through the roof. Like being annoyed with everybody that you thought that you loved and not being able to see your friends or go to restaurants that you enjoy going to, right? Like watching the news and seeing what's happening. When you're stressed out and you're struggling, the enemy comes along and says, this is going really bad, isn't it? This is going really bad. I wonder why God would let you go through this stuff, man. Have you heard this before? Why doesn't God keep you from this? Hmm, there must be a reason. And you think to yourself, if it's this bad when God's doing it, how much worse could it be if I was leading it? And how do I really know that God's word is true? And how do I really know that there's all these consequences? And how do I really know? How do I really know? Here's another time that you're vulnerable to this lie. When you want something that feels like it has a timestamp connected to it. When you think to yourself, if I ever want my life to be this, I need to do this now or get it now. If I ever really want this, then I have to do this right now. Can I ask you a question? How many big decisions have you made in a hurry that went well? But the enemy comes along and says, you don't want to miss out on that, do you? I mean, things are hard. If you miss out on that, it's gone forever. If you miss out on them or that thing or that decision, it's gone. And then you've missed it. That experience or that opportunity or that information, it's gone forever. I wonder why God wouldn't have just given it to you. You better decide now, why wouldn't God want this for you? And it's an interesting thing because we live in this culture in America where we assume that things are accessible and we assume that we're entitled and we assume if I could get it, why wouldn't I get it? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. You tell what I'm saying? And the other thing is that we say to ourselves, it's... it's it's my life, man. It's my experience. It's, it's my truth I've been hearing lately. My truth. But listen to 1 Corinthians 6. Or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you had from God? And this next phrase is one of the most un-American phrases in the entire Bible. And you are not your own. It's my life. No, it isn't. It's my decision. No, it isn't. It's my relationship. It's my money. It's my experience. No, it isn't. How dare you say that? How, why would you possibly say that? Because on the cross, Jesus bought you with his blood. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, then you're not yours. It's not yours. They're not yours. Your experience isn't yours. The opportunity isn't up to you. It's up to your Savior. Giving something up now for something better later, it isn't a sacrifice. It's an investment. I want to talk to you if you're single today. It drives me crazy when I hear pastors say and talk about purity as though it's some bad math equation. I know it's hard. Just grind it out and hang in there. 
It's not a sacrifice. It's an investment. You're giving up something now for something better later. You say, what's the something better later? <laughs> a honeymoon night that's innocent. A honeymoon night that's innocent, that's curious, that's optimistic, that's full of wonder. You say, that feels so far off. That's the enemy talking. The enemy says, you better decide now. There's that timestamp. You better decide now because pastor's always talking about Jesus coming back. And what if you never get to have... So let me talk bluntly to you, because I know the enemy tempts bluntly to you. What you're giving up is a high school, creepy high school sweaty kid giving you an awkward experience for his enjoyment at your expense that you're going to regret losing that innocence on a night when it should have been the primary emotion. See, how do you know that? Because I was in high school. Because I know what it feels like to go by the grace of God to experience my honeymoon night innocently. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. I don't care how cute she is, how handsome he is. I wouldn't trade it for anything. If you knew what Apple was going to be worth, you would have figured out ways to scratch together some money to make the investment. I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's not a sacrifice. It's an investment. Don't let the enemy say, you better do it now. Jesus might come back. (laughs) You better do it now. You might not get the chance. You better do it now. Choices don't have consequences. You better do it now. God's keeping something from you. You better do it now. Your life works best when you're leading it. Let me talk to you if you're married. Grass is greener. She's always nagging you. Choices don't have consequences. Better do it now. Better grab the reins. Nobody knows what you're clicking on. Nobody knows what you're spending money on. Nobody knows what you're doing. Choices don't have consequences. Did God really say? Creates this snowball. But giving something up now for something better later isn't a sacrifice. It's an investment. It's an investment. Line number five. Are you still with me? Are you all still with me? Okay. (laughs) I love y'all. And I want something for you. Lie number five. Your past dictates your future. And this is my favorite one. Whenever you read Genesis chapter three, you see that the enemy didn't have all the information. Right? You see that the enemy believed that if he could squash what God was trying to do in the garden, it would incurably and unfixably permanently ruin all of God's plans in the future. Are you with me? It's the same thing that the enemy would have never wanted Jesus to go to the cross if he knew what Jesus was actually doing. He had bad information. And can I tell you, some of you think that something that you did in the past is uncurably, unfixably permanent. That your past is proving out your future. And when you're stuck in that spot, you're believing a lie and thinking like the enemy. Because the enemy didn't have in the equation of his thinking, grace. He didn't have in the equation of his thinking forgiveness. He didn't have in the equation of his thinking reconciliation and redemption. He didn't have a way to put that in the equation. His equation is linear. You do bad things, you're permanently ruined. The gospel is you do bad things, God puts them on Jesus, and you're healed. And whenever I think like the enemy, it creates a doom loop. Creates a doom loop of defensiveness and regret. My marriage has been terrible for so long. And it's your fault. It's not my fault. It's your fault. But it is my fault. And I don't know how to stop. And you won't stop and I don't know how to stop. So we're stuck. I've been struggling as a parent. And if you would listen better, I'd be a better parent, but I actually know that I'm not a good parent. And so I'm defensive with you and I'm ashamed of myself. And it's this doom loop that creates because there's nothing in the equation that is the stopgap of grace. 
2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Worldly grief, I don't like that it's happened, death, permanent. Worldly grief says, I don't like that it's happening. I don't like that it happened. I don't like that it did it. There's nothing to change it. Repentance, then, is a moment of pain to avoid a lifetime of defensiveness and regret. A moment of pain, squaring to reality. I need grace. I did it. I decided, and choices have consequences. I thought God was trying to keep something from me, and he wasn't. I took back control, and I ruined it. I didn't believe when God said, this was best and that was destructive and I did it and I'm sorry but I'm not sorry in the permanent way I'm sorry in the I give you control way and listen to what Psalm 34 says those who look to him <laughs> come on are radiant marriages that have been struggling and then look to Jesus are radiant. Women who feel abused and discarded and invaluable who look to Jesus are radiant. Men who feel weak and incompetent and incapable and passive when they look to Jesus are radiant. Pasts that are broken beyond repair, that the story has been written there are no commas, there is no dot, dot, dot. It's an exclamation point. You ruined it, it's over, it's done. When you look to Jesus, it's made radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. This is what I want for you. Not to look back over your relationships and say, I did it perfect, because it isn't gonna happen. Not to look at your marriage and say, I did everything right, because you'd be a liar. Not to look at your kids and say, I just was the perfect this and that. To be able to look at the reality of your life and say, I wasn't perfect, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I am radiant and I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of my failings. I'm not stuck in my failings. I repented and I'm repenting and I'm repentant of certain things and in my brokenness God showed up in my brokenness God made it new and even though my marriage was a mess tomorrow it can be better even though my kid was rebelling tomorrow they could come home even though I'm sideways with this or that or upside down on these or those in the in-between when I own to my failings and repent before God I give him control, I take him at his word, I acknowledge that the consequences were put on Jesus and I have an opportunity to start again. Over the next three weeks, I'm gonna give you a lot of practical things, but I can't give you any of those if we don't start with the gospel. I can't give you anything practical about your relationships if you don't first understand that whatever has happened is nailed to the cross. That whatever you regret it's laying next to an empty tomb. And if you can't have hope in the person and work of Jesus, I can't help you with your relationship. But if you can get your eyes on to Jesus, anything's possible. Anything can be made new, no matter how long it's been bad. Can I get an amen on that? Oh. Why don't you stand up? Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the gospel of Jesus. God, we aren't Christians because of our goodness. We aren't Christians because our marriages are always great, because we make the best decisions, because we're perfect parents, because we're great bosses or employees, because our finances always fall in order. We're Christians because we needed a savior. And Lord, some of us, as your spirit's been unpacking this word. We're seeing places that we have believed or are believing lies. And the response isn't condemnation and regret. The response is to look to Jesus. To bring him the P 
pieces of our decisions that have consequences and say, would you put these back together? Would you make them radiant? Would you take my shame? Would you make me new? Would you reconcile and redeem and restore and resurrect what's been put to death by my choices? And God, we start there with our relationships, that we need you and that you're available. And so speak grace, speak new beginnings, speak second, third, fourth, fifth, five hundredth chances over our hearts. Speak mercy, speak forgiveness, speak hope. And let it be for your glory and our joy. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
one weekend. Thousands and thousands and thousands of you gathering together with one purpose, to come before God and to ask the question, how do you want us to live? Guys, this is the story of If Gathering. Women from all different backgrounds, women from all different countries, women from all different races and, and ages, and guys, we need this more than ever. We want you to bring your people together in your places, wherever you feel safe, however that, that looks for you this March. We want you to bring your people together on mission, praying and asking God, how do we lead out of this? Do not miss this. Join us live, gather your people, tell everybody you know, and let's go and imagine a world that is unified again and on mission for the glory of God. I wanna thank you so much for your continued financial support. Your generous gifts help fund the many life-changing ministries at Graceway. You can make your gift by going to visitgraceway.org slash give. We would love an opportunity to pray with you today. If you would like to pray with a pastor, call or text us at 816-423-2877 and our team will set up a time for you to talk on the phone or video chat. And don't forget, if you'd like to deepen your relationship with Jesus and make a lasting impact on your community, register for Growth Track today at 10.30 a.m. or noon at visitgraceway.org slash growth track. Before we go, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your message. We thank you, O oh Lord, uh, that you have made us for relationship and you have made us for love. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word that um, removes um, the blinders, that removes unbelief, that help us see the light. And thank you for shedding your light in this aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will be glorified as we yes. apply your word in our relationships. Mm -hmm. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we see relationships in our family flourish, relationship with our friends with flourishing and in our communities flourishing in our relationships. Lord, be glorified be glorified in this community, be glorified in this church, be glorified in this city as we forge deep and meaningful relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. To you be all the glory, yes, to you be all the praise. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name yes. I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, have a great week and we'll see you next time.